Well, a very good morning to you to the second of our Bible readings in week three of Keswick Convention 2022. Special welcome as you're flooding in, maybe literally flooding in with the rain this morning into the tent here. Welcome if you're joining us on Relay 2 and also on live stream. It's lovely to have you joining us this morning. Do want to encourage you, if you to send in your pictures and photos either via social media. We've had a couple of great comments in uh, here. One, our kids have loved their groups this week, and we're so grateful to all of their leaders and helpers. This was our view on the way in this morning. I think that might have been yesterday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Looks rather bright, though it is brightening up. And we had another one here. The, the couple here, their 10th wedding anniversary today. Many congratulations to you. So they're, they're manning one of the stalls in base camp. If you haven't had a chance to visit the different stalls in base camp, then do have, make the most of that opportunity. So just to connect with social media, use the hashtag KezConv22 or at Keswick Ministries whether it's Twitter or Instagram and so on, or on the comments page. Now, yesterday, I don't know if you're going to use one sentence summary for yesterday's Bible reading in the life of Jacob. Um, I said to Martin beforehand, how would relentless grace for rat bags work? <laughs> and he said, yeah, that would do pretty well. So in God's kindness, we were thinking yesterday about his relentless grace for us. And let's pause as we may and think about that grace before we stand and sing. Let's pray together. Just a moment of quiet to still our hearts. Our loving God and Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that in him are all riches. Thank you for the new life we have in him, the supreme grace that we receive in him. We're conscious of our own frailty, our flaws, our weaknesses, divisions, so many other things. Thank you that we can come to you knowing your blood cleanses us. And we do pray in your mercy and grace as we sing your praise, pray to you and hear your word. You would meet with us by your spirit. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. You are the 
God, you do not think you won't grow. Lord God, that you reign forever. You lift us up when we're feeling weak, when we're feeling tired, when we're feeling alone, when we're feeling abandoned. Thank you so much that you lift us up. You're with us all the time. Amen. Amen. Morning, everybody. So good to see so many of you last night. Made it through to, uh, to the tent. Uh, to the, uh, not to the tent. You made it here, but then you made it through to the bookstore. Uh, if you haven't yet found it, base camp is kind of just down there and to the left. Follow the crowds. And uh, to the couple with the wedding anniversary, 10 years, congratulations. And um, let me just say, you can have 10 quid, okay? For the 10 years of your marriage, you can have 10 quid for free, okay? And the couple with the golden wedding anniversary, uh, congratulations. So, um, um, now then, the Christian life, it is hard, isn't it? The Christian life is hard, but it is good. We are called to come and find life, but we find life by dying to ourselves. And David Platt has written an outstanding book called Follow Me, looking at the call uh, by Christ on our lives. And I wonder, perhaps you've been a Christian for a number of years now, and you look back and you think, I just wonder if some of the spark I had in those early years has begun to fade, beginning to cool a little bit, and I need to, I need to revisit that call that God has to to come and die. I challenge you to get this book, maybe read it with a friend, discuss, learn together, walk through this challenge together. Uh, David Platt has been a missionary overseas in some of the hardest places uh, uh, in the world to go and now is, is seeking to energize and mobilize people uh, in mission. I, I challenge you, get this book and work through it slowly and carefully and see uh, that call of God on our lives again. Now, many of us, perhaps years ago, read... Um, um, uh, Rebecca Manley Pippitt's uh, Out of the Salt Shaker. And I remember as a student being given that and, uh, and being challenged to read it. She has a follow-on uh, called Stay Salt, looking at how it is in today's culture. We can take the lessons from that book that she wrote some years ago to be salty today. We need this in our church, don't we, to be radically different uh, from the world around us to, to maintain that, that saltiness. She does it in three sections, and for each section, it's very practical, very helpful, looking at how we can be at staying salt and encourage you to get that. And then finally, we've got a little one which we'll do as an exit book. Now, if you're, if you're new this week and perhaps don't know quite how this works, as you leave the two exits uh, uh, on, on your way out, have a quid ready, just throw it in the bucket, and then this book can be yours. It's called Before You, Before you Share Your Faith by Matt Smethurst. You might remember he had one 
that we highlighted last year called uh, Before You Open Your Bible, looking at nine heart postures as we open God's Word. This is before you share your faith, and he looks at five ways to be prepared, as Rebecca puts it, to be salty, to share our faith, to ensure that we're holding out Jesus to others. Never, never forget just how it was that John the Baptist, when Jesus arrived, he pointed away from himself to Jesus and said, look, look at Christ. And that's what this little book is helping us to do in five steps. It's only short, it won't take you long to read. It's only a quid, and if you haven't got the money, borrow it from somebody else, put it in the bucket. And why not this afternoon on a dry or maybe wet Keswick, give it an hour or two to read through this book and see how it is that we can be salty as we go out uh, into the world and present people with Jesus. Thanks. Thanks, John, very much. Just a few things to highlight coming up over the next 24 hours for many of you and different groups of people. So this afternoon, the mission personnel reception, that's at 2.30. This for mission work is on leave. Time of encouragement and sharing together across in the uh, pencil factory. You need to sign in or book in at reception, please, there. And then today, of course, as part of the Keswick Unconventional Art Stream, we've got another lunchtime concert today. This time it's with Stuart and Carol Henderson and with Yvonne Lyon across at 1.15 in the packing hall and base camp. And then also at 3 o'clock this afternoon, there's an afternoon workshop to meet the artists in residence, gardener and gardener. And then tomorrow morning, instead of having the seminars, which you, many of you have been attending that day by day, Monday, Tuesday, they, they start Thursday, Friday, we've got the Keswick Lecture and del delighted to have John Stevens, who's the National Director of FIEC, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. Um, some have described him as the Archbishop or the Pope of the FIEC. You can try that with John later. <laughs> He's talking about British evangelicalism in the post-COVID context. That's here tomorrow morning, 9.30. And in the afternoon tomorrow, we've got a drama written and produced by Artless Theatre. It's called If Prison Walls Could Speak. So it's a one-man play based on the imprisoned prisoner, Isis, Faith in the Face of Evil. It tells the true life story of Petr Jacek, who in 2015 was imprisoned for his work aiding the persecuted church in Sudan. That's 2.30 tomorrow. It's a free event, no tickets in here. And I'd just love to spend a few moments. You may have picked up from the Derwent Project video last night and then also this morning, and also from leaflets or from the website, that the Keswick Ministries is more than just a convention. And one of the things we've been doing, which the Durham Project is helping to support, is to develop teaching and training programs through the year. I guess many, put your hand up if you've come across one or been in one or seen information about one. Quite a few, but quite a few haven't yet. Or maybe you didn't want to put your hands up. I just want to highlight three for you, which I trust will be really helpful to serve the local church. So the first one is called Leading Well. It's a workshop for elders and lay leaders. So often in our churches, we invest in the pastor, the senior pastor, and we pay for training, that kind of thing. But most churches run on the energy, commitment, and gifts of the elders and lay leaders. But there's very little in the way of teaching and training and support for them. So this is a course aimed specifically for you. What's the vision for the church? How do I understand the context in which I'm ministering? How do I work well in a church team? How do I know more about myself? Those kinds of questions. That's called leading well. And then we've got a second course called Face in the Second Half. This is for those of us in the second half of our lives. As I said uh, last week, my daughter, with a relatively recent birthday, not the most recent, said, uh, Dad, did you know now that you're nearer 90 than 18? Thanks, darling. So, but to think through, many of us are either in the second half of our lives or caring or supporting or working with those in the second half of our lives, how to empower and equip and inspire those to live for Christ. Last night, Jonty was reminding us of the value of learning to pray from those in the second half of life. How can we in the second half of our lives live well for Christ? 
We're thinking particularly next year around a church for everybody. One of the joys of being on this site is that young and old, everyone all together, that's faith in the second half. And the third course to highlight is the, what we now call the Keswick Leadership Course. It used to be the uh, Leadership Workshop. And this is for leaders in all spheres of life, business, charity, um, small businesses, church leadership, and so on, to help you to live for Christ in the work that you've got, in the place, the sphere that God's got for you, to be people of integrity and resilience and people who know their identity in Christ. And I'd be delighted, we're going to have reading the Bible for us in a moment, and before Martin preaches, Sarah Hamilton, Sarah. I'm doing this. Lovely to have you here, Sarah. Thank you. So um, tell us about yourself. Um, I was working as a leader in the NHS and I came on the Keswick Leadership Course last year and it was a real, really great opportunity for me to enjoy uh, thinking about leadership from a Christian perspective and doing that with people working in secular contexts, in Christian organisations and also in the church. And the other thing I found really beneficial was just having some time out to think about what are the gifts and skills God has given me and how can I use them in my future work life as I think forward about the work that God will give me. Wonderful, thank you. So before Sarah reads the Bible and Martin preaches, let's pray together. Gracious, loving God, thank you the way you speak through what you've spoken. By your Holy Spirit, speak as your word is read and preached and open our hearts and our minds to you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do be turning in your Bibles to Genesis 27. Genesis chapter 27. We're going to start at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the, tasty kind of, the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare some tasty food for, to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him, and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, Son, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goatskins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? 
The Lord, gave me, the Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near, so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate. And he brought some wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and he said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to Sarah for reading. Uh, do, do we have any, um, any Scottish people in this morning? Yeah, I, I learned a new word recently. I, I, I want to try it. You can help me to let me know if I'm getting this right. Is this what a Scottish person is today, what you would call Dreek? Yeah, that's right, isn't it? It's Dreek. I mean, he's kind of, as I understand, he's grey and damp and a bit windy and just a bit, uh, is that right? And how many of you are camping? Yeah, how, how are you doing? Is it okay? I remember a number of years ago, uh, we had a week where it rained almost all week and, and I was serving with the youth team. I remember two of the, two of the youth, they came in and I said, well, what's it like camping? They said, well, everything is damp. Our clothes are damp, the sleeping bag is damp, the pillow is damp, and they were kind of going back to that. So um, I hope you're doing okay if you're camping. And uh, I just say, it's a little bit windy. Uh, don't, let, don't let the seagulls or the wind distract you. Uh, it, it is perfectly safe. Uh, it's just a bit noisy, um, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll focus uh, as we go. And, and um, if you've got Genesis 27 open, that'd be great. We're going to look at the whole chapter. That felt quite a lot to read, um, but we will be in all of Genesis 27 together uh, this morning. So if you can see that, uh, that will be a great help to you and to me. Uh, and as we begin, uh, how many of you can remember a TV show called Super Nanny? Any of you have watched Super Nanny? Uh, if you don't know what Super Nanny is, well, it was about, well, the title gives it away, it was about a lady called Jo Frost. And Jo Frost was considered to be, well, the, the Super Nanny. She was the person who could, who could come into your home and fix all of your problems that you were having with your terrible toddlers. And each episode would begin with her, she'd turn up on the doorstep and, um, and a kind of a, a bedraggled parent would open the door and Joe Frost would walk in and, and she'd walk into to like the, the war zone. It was just total carnage, you know, just, just mess everywhere, felt tip all over the walls, uh, blood on the carpets, these kind of Tasmanian devil children running around and the parents just completely at their wits end, not having any clue what to do. And, and Joe Frost would, would kind of step in. She'd take charge. She'd take control of the situation. And over the course of the episode, she'd, she'd turn it into a, a scene of just absolute serenity. These beautiful, well-mannered, perfect children. And um, by the end, all was well. And, 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 as, and here's how I watched that program. I don't think it was the way you were supposed to watch it. But the way I watched that program was to look at it and go, phew, at least my kids aren't as bad as their kids. <laughs> I don't, I'm sure that's not how I was meant to, but that, that is how I kind of watched it. You looked and you went, well, at least, at least it's not as bad as their situation. Maybe you've had it in the supermarket. We, we've had it at church a few weeks ago. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, second row, always happens when you're near the front, doesn't it? Uh, the, the, there's one of our dear families at church. And uh, their, their middle kid, about halfway through the service, just has like an epic 
meltdown. Like, you know, one of those kind of tantrums where face down on the floor, screaming, ah! You know, the fists are going, the legs are going, and the parents just have to pick it up and walk. <laughs> are you watching? Are you watching? Going, well, at least it wasn't one of mine. <laughs> and the reason I start there is because as you read these chapters in Genesis, as you read chapter 27, I want to encourage you to resist the urge to read these chapters a bit like you watch Super Nanny. Okay, I want you to resist the urge to read and think, phew, well, at least I'm not as bad as those people. At least, at least my life isn't as messed up as them. At least I'm not as sinful and wicked as evil as, as those people. I want you to resist that urge. Because as we look at it, re- remember what we said yesterday, as we look at, at these chapters, it, it's a bit like the experience of seeing the Mona Lisa. Do you remember we said that? You, you kind of look at the Mona Lisa and you go, oh. It's a bit of a letdown. But then you look at the the Veronese, the kind of 10 meter by 7 meter picture of Jesus, and you go, wow, that's amazing. I want you to see in these chapters that it's not just a portrait, it's a mirror. As as we look at these people, as we look at what's going on in their lives and actually in their, their hearts, as we dig a bit deeper, I think we're going to see more of ourselves in here than we might actually be comfortable with. We will continue to see God's relentless grace at work in messy, failed, flawed people. And here's one more question, just to kind of orientate ourselves to Genesis 27. If you were going to try and, and, and if you were turning chapter 27 into a movie, who would you cast? And what genre would it be? What kind of film do you think Genesis 27 would make? I think, I think if you were making this film, I, I think it's a gangster movie. I think it's a gangster movie. I, th- I think you need Marlon Brando, you need Al Pacino. Uh, they, they are all gangsters. And I want you to pick that up as you read this, because sometimes we read this, don't we? And, we, and your first impression might be, oh, poor, poor little old Isaac. He seems such a sweet, dear little old man losing his sight. And, and haven't they been awful to him? No, no, look, we're going to see they are, they are all bandits. They are all baddies. They are all gangsters. They all behave appallingly. But God's grace is still at work in the mess. In some ways, uh, Genesis 27 is it's the narrative of the truth of Romans 3 verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. Genesis 27 is the narrative of that truth. And as we get into it, I want to break uh, chapter 27 down for us into um, five scenes. And uh, and the first scene that we see is, uh, we see it here, it's, uh, it's Isaac's plan. That's scene one. Uh, deception and devastation, here's Isaac's plan, beginning at verse 1, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for his elder son Esau and said to him, my son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I'm now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then get your equipment, your quiver and bow, go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, what is going on here at this moment? It's a really significant point, or or at least it could or should be in the life of a patriarchal family. It's the moment when the head of the family, towards the end of his life, pronounces his blessing on his children. And and in some ways, the the birthright and the blessing, they they really belong together. They really go together. The birthright, as we saw yesterday, it's about the promise of God. It's about inheritance, but it's about more. And the blessing sort of belongs with it. It's this blessing that that had been given to Abraham. It was to pass down the family line. He was going to make their name great. He was going to be their God. He was going to give them land. He was going to make them into a nation. All the nations of the earth were going to be blessed. And, and this blessing is pronounced. Jacob will do something similar himself at the end of the book of Genesis. 
on his deathbed with all his family around him, he will pronounce various blessings on his sons. And it's not just sort of a prayer or a hope, it's really a prophetic announcement of what will be. Now, how does that tie into what is going on here? Because there's a couple of strange things, isn't there? Uh, essentially, what is going on is, is, is what is happening is it's all going on in secret. It's all going on in secret, isn't it? Like the, the whole family should be here, but it's just Isaac colluding with Esau. Rebecca is nowhere to be seen. Jacob is nowhere to be seen. And Isaac himself is behaving really in a way to kind of manipulate circumstances to his own ends. You'll notice, do you notice what he says? He's old and he wants to confer the blessing before he dies. But I want you to notice this detail because here's the thing. He's not actually about to die. Notice back 1 verse 20, chapter 26 verse 34. We see Esau is 40 years old. Now, how old was Isaac when he had Esau? He was 60. So how old is he now? He's 100. Now, fast forward, Genesis 35 and verse 28. And we see at the death of Isaac, Isaac lived 180 years. He's nowhere near dead at all. 100 is, yeah, that's old to us. But he's still in middle age. He's got, he's got eight decades before he'll die. And here he is manipulating events away from Rebecca, away from Jacob. Because he wants to confer the, the blessing on Esau. And notice his amnesia. Do you see what he's, he's, he's forgotten? Actually, both of them are forgotten. The announcement has already been given by God as to what should happen. Back in 25, verse 23. When God announced to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb, two peoples from within you will be separated. One will be stronger than the other. The elder will serve the younger. The blessing was meant to go to Jacob. And Esau too seems to have forgotten as the plan goes on that he had already despised the birthright, but here he is going along with it. What is, what is he doing? What is Isaac doing? I think Isaac at this moment, he's doing that thing, isn't he, that, that, that many of us do. Is it simply the case that he's, he's forgotten the announcement that God had, had, had given? Has it just slipped his mind? Or actually, is he doing that thing that we do where he's putting his wants over God's words? Do you ever find yourself doing that? He's putting his wants over God's word. God has already said, God has already given the blessing as it's meant to go. And Isaac says, no, my wants over God's words. Where are you tempted to do that? Where are you tempted in, in areas of your life to think, yeah, I know, I know what God's word says, but, but I really want this. I really want to pursue this. I really want to do this. And, and, and maybe we kind of, minimize bits of God's word or we, 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 we kind of play it down and say, I'm, I'm sure God's not that bothered. I'm sure that's not that important. Maybe it's in, if you're a Christian, pursuing a, a, a romantic relationship with someone who isn't a Christian. And you kind of know what God's word says about that, but you think, but, but they seem so nice and, um, and I just feel it so strongly and surely they're the one and, and it's not that big a deal, is it? Maybe it's the issue of, of, of your, your money. You know God calls us to radical generosity, but, but you, kind of, you stretch your finances to, to get the better house, to get the newer car, and, and there's not enough left over to give what you could generously. But you think, but God's not that bothered, is he? You can put our wants over God's words. I know of a situation where family members have fallen out and one family member will simply refuse to apologize. They will refuse to reconcile because they'd rather save face than have to do that hard thing of apologizing. My wants over God's word. Maybe in your workplace, it's, it's turning a blind eye to some slightly dubious working practices. 
because your career's at stake and the money's too good and you're on the ladder and you just think, it's not that big a deal, is it? Our wants over God's words. And when we find ourselves in that position, we, um, we need the help of others, don't we? We need some good people around us. That's what's lacking here. People around us who can help us, who can counsel us, who can advise us, trusted friends, who can pray for us. Make yourself vulnerable with someone else and let them speak God's truth into your life. That's the first scene. Isaac's plan. Second scene is, well, Rebecca's got a plan too. Did you notice? We thought Rebecca was out of the way, uh, off the scene, but it turns out she wasn't. Verse 5, Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke. She's just in the room next door. She's been earwigging. She knows the whole thing. And when Esau left for the open country to hunt game and, and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son, Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau. Now, there's a moment here, isn't there? There's a moment of decision for Rebecca. There's a moment as she overhears the plan. What should she do? It seems that she could, or she should, perhaps go and talk to Isaac. Talk to Esau, say, listen, I, I, I couldn't help it, but I, I heard what was going on. How, what's happening? What, why are we doing this? What has happened to us? How do we fix this? This isn't right. There's a, there's a moment of decision for her where she can choose to do the right thing, but instead she chooses something else, doesn't she? She comes up with a plan. Uh, and the plan is, she says to Jacob, bring me some game, prepare me some tasty food to eat, that I might uh, give you my blessing. Now, my son, listen carefully, do what I tell you. Go out to the flock, bring me two choice young goats that I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. In uh, 1943, uh, there was uh, a well-known uh, Second World War operation called Operation Mincemeat. It was one of the, the, the famous Allied plans uh, to deceive the enemy. And uh, the plan went something like this. Now, it's probably not really ethical. I don't think you could do it today. But um, some special forces uh, operatives managed to get hold of the corpse of a homeless person. I told you it wasn't very nice. And they dressed him up in kind of a Royal Marine Officer clothing. And they planted these fake ID documents and this fake correspondence on the body, which appeared to be some kind of correspondence between two generals. And the correspondence said that there was going to be an allied attack on Sardinia. And they took the body and by submarine they, they deposited it just off the coast of Spain. Two Spanish fishermen, they, they find this body, they haul it in, and they pass on the intelligence to the German forces that were occupying the place. And um, sure enough, uh, Hitler fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. All of the forces that had been in Sicily were now, were now deployed to Sardinia to defend against the invasion, which left open the way for the Allied forces to head for Sicily. And they... They invaded and, and they liberated Sicily in a mission that should have taken months. It just took a matter of weeks. How did they do it? Through deception. That is what, uh, that is, what is going on here, isn't it? That's Rebecca's plan. Jacob, you play dress up. I'll make the food. You dress up like your brother. You go in to the blind old fool. Tell him it's Esau. Give him the food. Get the blessing. Get out. It's the plan. It's the plan. And then Jacob. What does Jacob make of this? Jacob too has a moment, doesn't he? Jacob has the same moment Rebecca's had. Where, where he, he hears the plan and he could say, couldn't he? He could say, Mum, I don't think this is a very good idea. It doesn't feel the right thing to do. Maybe we should go and talk to Dad. Maybe we should talk to Esau. Maybe, maybe we should have a little kind of family intervention. 
This doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem the thing that God would want us to do. But what does Jacob do? What's Jacob's response? Notice, notice what Jacob is afraid of in all of this. Jacob said to Rebekah, verse 11, But my brother Esau is a hairy man. Well, I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I love this. I would appear to be tricking him. <laughs> appear? No, no, you would just be tricking him. There's no appear about it. And would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. What is Jacob's fear? His fear is getting caught, isn't it? Do you notice the thing that Jacob fears is not disobedience against a holy, almighty, perfect God. He's scared of getting caught. At this moment, he's displaying this. Uh, Tim Keller uses this, this quote, which says, so often, the way in which we behave really demonstrates that we are, we are morally restrained rather than supernaturally changed. We are morally restrained by the people around us rather than being supernaturally changed. Why do we do what we do or why do we not do things? Is it because we, we fear displeasing God? Is it because we fear offending God? Is it because we don't want to disobey God? Or is it because we're scared of getting caught? Do we fear the consequences of sin more than the punisher of sin? You ever tempted in that way? Here's, a, here's, here's perhaps a trivial example that reveals something deeper. Um, quite often before, before a meeting, uh, our documents will get circulated and, uh, and they'll get sent round and we'll, we'll be expected to have read the documents before our, our church, church meeting of, of one of our leadership teams and, and, and someone will send me something and, uh, and maybe, it's, maybe it's one of those boring policy documents, you know the ones you've got to have, but are just, just like soporific uh, the GDPR policy or something like that. And, and the person chairing the meeting comes up to me and says, uh, have, you, have, you, have you read the documents? And I go, yeah. I hadn't. Why, why did I say yes? Why, why did I lie in that moment? Because I fear what he may think of me more than I fear what God might think of me. Don't I in that moment? It's a silly example, isn't it? But, but doesn't it reveal something of my heart? I care more what he thinks than what God thinks as I just tell that little white lie. And then uh, Rebecca says these tragic words, actually, in verse 13. Do you notice what she says? His mother said to him, my son... Let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. Isn't that a terrible prayer to pray? Is that an awful thing to, to say? Is, is, don't worry about it. Let, let the curse fall on me. We're going to return to those words a little bit later. Of course, the challenge for both of them, perhaps for Jacob particularly, is the, the challenge of, of kind of swimming against the current all around. You know, you see the kind of the salmon make their migration upstream. You see the sheer amount of effort it takes for them to, to go against the flow. That's so often true for us, isn't it? To, to live distinctive lives, to be different in the places God has put us, to, to not go with the crowd in, in all of the evil plans and schemes, to, to swim against, to, to go against the flow, to go upstream. That requires a tremendous amount of effort of conscious determination, but sometimes that is what we'll be called to do, even when it causes upset, even when it displeases our own families. And so they go on with the plan. She, he went and he got them and he brought them to his mother and, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of her elder son, Esau, which she had in the house, and put them on her youngest son. And here, here's our third heading. This is Jacob's deceit. 
They, they've decided what the plan needs to be. They, they know what they need to do. They're going to go through with it. And the, the con is on, so to speak. And, uh, and we see it here, don't we, Jacob, uh, as he begins. She takes the clothes in verse 15. And uh, verse 16, she covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. There's a really interesting little, little detail there. The word goat skins occurs only one other place in the entire book of Genesis. The, the little Hebrew word for, for skins, animal skins. I wonder if you know where it is. It's right back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Where after the fall, after their sin, God in his mercy and his grace, he, he clothes Adam and Eve with animal skins to cover their sin and their shame. And here's Rebecca trying a similar trick. She is trying to cover the sin and the shame with the animal skins. But of course, God's intent was for good. Hers is for evil. These are not divine clothes. These are the devil's clothes that Jacob is, is putting on. And he goes in. She handed to her son the tasty food. In verse 18, he went into his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game that you may give me your blessing. And do you notice verse 20? Isaac is immediately suspicious. He's immediately suspicious. He, he knows something is wrong. We're going to see, he hears the voice. His eyesight's no good, but he knows the voice. And, and so he asks, doesn't he? He asks the obvious question, verse 20. Look, how, how did you find it so quickly? Esau's been sent out on a, on a day's worth of hunting to go and catch something and, and kill it and, and cook it and bring it back. But, but all of this has happened so fast. He says, look, how, how did you find success? Notice what he says. Notice what Jacob replies in verse 20. The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. This is the only time in the entire chapter where the Lord's name will appear. And it appears as it is being used in vain on the lips of Jacob. And do you notice too, he says, what does he say? He says, the Lord your God. Now, maybe we shouldn't read too much into that. That may just be a, a turn of phrase, but it might indicate something of where Jacob's heart is really at. He, he wants God's stuff, but he doesn't want God. He wants the birthright and the blessing that may come from God's hands, but he's perhaps not yet ready to claim God as his Lord in every sense. And there's a, there's a kind of irony in his words, aren't there? Where it says, the Lord your God gave me success. There's a sense in which he speaks more truth than he knows in his lie. Actually, the Lord will give him success. In fact, any and all of the success that he will enjoy in his life will come from the Lord. He just doesn't quite know it yet. But, but all of his blessings are from God. All of the grace is from God in spite of of his sin, his failure, his evil. And as we go through the scene, as it un un kind of unfolds for us, you, you can feel the tension building, can't you? Uh, you can feel the tension building as we go through uh, the senses. Verse 21, Isaac says to Jacob, come near so I can touch you to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the, the hands are the hands of Esau. He didn't recognize him, for his hands were hairy, like those of his brother Esau. He can't, he can't see, but he can hear. It's the voice of Jacob. And the touch, well, it feels like Esau. And then he's going to taste and then he's going to catch a smell 
of Esau's clothes. But Isaac's in a difficult position at the moment, isn't he? Isaac is, well, he's caught, isn't he? He's trapped. He's got his suspicions, but what can he do about it? But what can he, he can't say, can he? Notice what he can't do here. He can't say, Rebecca, I, I'm just secretly trying to give the blessing to Esau. Would you mind coming in and just checking it's really him? He, he can't, can he? He's trapped. He's got to go through with it. It's a bit like the story of um, the vicar who decided to skip church one Sunday morning to go and play golf instead. And uh, he, he phoned up one of his colleagues and he put on his best sick voice and he said, <laughs> Look, um, I really very, very poorly. Uh, I, I, I can't preach this morning. Can you, can you, can you take it? The colleague says, yeah, leave it, leave it with me. And he puts the phone down, picks up his golf clubs and off he goes. And, and the devil comes to God and says, God, isn't that, isn't that one of your servants? Isn't, isn't he supposed to be a, an upstanding Christian pillar of the community, a leader in your church? And he's, he's lying and he's skiving church to go and play golf. God says, don't worry, it's all in hand. The vicar lines up on the first tee, tees up his ball, gets out his driver, has a little waggle, and then, he, and then he unleashes. He unleashes possibly the best shot he has ever hit in his life. He absolutely creams it straight down the middle of the fairway, takes a massive kick up, goes over 300 yards, rolls up onto the green and trickles into the hole. It's the best shot he's ever hit in his life. And the devil turns to God and says, what's that? Why, is that? You said you had it in hand. And he's just hit the best shot he's ever in his life. It's gone 300 yards. It's bounced onto the fairway. It's gone straight in the hole. How is that having the matter in hand? And God says, ah, but who's he going to tell? <laughs> who's he going to tell? Whose eyes are going to tell? Can't tell anyone, can he? He's got to go through with it. He and Jacob are trapped now as the events unfold. And as he comes close, uh, he brings him the food. In verse 25, he ate. He bought some wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and he kissed him. It's the betrayer's kiss, isn't it? It's the Judas kiss kiss. And when Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, the abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. It's, a, it's an echo, isn't it, of the, the earlier promises. There's, there's some kind of new things, but there's echoes of what's gone before to Abraham. And, and Isaac is kind of reiterating, he's passing it down to Jacob. And, and you may think, how did that happen? How did Jacob and his mother kind of come up with this evil, wicked, awful plan and get a blessing out of it? Why does God bless them for this? It's a reminder, isn't it, that God can bring good out of evil. We see it in the life of, of Jacob's son, Joseph, as his own brothers betray him and sell him into slavery. And he, he rises to power in Egypt and his, his wisdom and actions because God gives it to him and enables him to, to save many lives. And as his brothers come and see him, he says, you meant it for evil. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God can bring good. He can bring blessing even out of evil circumstances, situations and people. We need to be careful, don't we, as we say that. We need to be careful that doesn't become a Christian cliche. We need to be careful that doesn't become sort of fridge magnet Christian cliche as we share lives with one another. 
God, we're so careful with us as, as we come alongside those going through difficult situations. We, we don't just say, well, God can bring good out of evil. All things work together for good. If you're, if you're in the valley, you need a bit more care, don't you? I, I, I think of the girl who uh, used to come to our church who had been sexually abused. I, I, you can't just go up and say, oh, well, all, all things work together for good. God will bring good out of evil. Now, we must never make this a cliche. We must always remember to weep with those who weep. We must always read everything the Bible has to say and to, to hold on to categories of, of lament, to seek justice, to lift up the downcast. But nevertheless, the comfort is here, the truth is here, that God is able. We might not always see it. Richard Coken, who was here last week, used the illustration, I'm sure you've heard it, of like the tapestry. You know, as we, as we look up to heaven, we just see the back of the tapestry and all the threads and there's, there's no sense to be made, but from his side, he sees the picture that he's creating. We, we may never see how good can be brought out of our evil in our lives in, in this life, but we trust the promise. We trust the character of God that he is able. He is able to bring good things even out of the darkest of our situations. Here's our fourth scene. We've seen Isaac's plan. We've seen Rebecca's plan. We've seen Jacob's deceit. And now we see two scenes of backfire. Kind of scene one is uh, the plan backfires on Isaac and Esau. Do you notice verse um, 30? Uh, No sooner has Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence... His brother Esau came in from hunting and he'd prepared the food and he brought it in. He said, my father, please sit up and eat some of my games so that you may give me your blessing. And his father asked him, who are you? I'm your son. He answered, your firstborn Esau. Notice Isaac trembled violently. He is, he is physically shaken by what's happened. He, he realises what's gone on. He realises Jacob has come in and tricked him out of the blessing. And now really there's, there's nothing left for Esau. Esau bursts out with this, this bitter cry, verse 34. He says, bless me, me too, my father. It's backfired. At the end. Uh, the latter part, the end of the, uh, the 19th century, there was a lady who lived in America called Susanna Salter. No, no relation. And uh, she lived in a small town in Kansas called Argonia. And uh, her father was mayor of the town. Uh, her husband was uh, the clerk of the town. And, and she herself was actively involved in politics. And on the 4th of April, 1887, to her surprise, she found herself elected as the mayor. It was to her surprise because she hadn't put her name forward. A group of men in the town, as as a stunt, had added her name to the slate. They had hoped that in so doing, they would humiliate her and discourage women from being involved in politics. As it happened, she got 60% of the vote and won by a landslide. (laughs) So it backfired. The plan backfired, and and, and here it backfires badly on Isaac and Esau. What what does Esau do in the response? Well, he he cries out, he laments, he weeps, asks his dad, is is, is there anything you've got for me? In verse 39, his, his father gives him, well, it's more of a curse than a blessing, isn't it? Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness or away from the dew of heaven. You'll live by the sword and you'll serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw off his yoke. And notice how Esau responds to what's going on. Verse 36, he says, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. And you kind of find yourself thinking, is that... Is that quite right, Esau? Is that how it really went down? Did he he really trick you out of the birthright? Or did you despise it? 
and exchange it for a bowl of soup? Is he, has he really tricked you this time too? Were you not in on it with your dad? Did, did you know what was going on and that the plan you were cooking up together? What's Esau doing? He's, he's doing that thing, isn't he? I think we all do when we are wronged, when we find ourselves in these things. He's playing the blame game. He's playing the victim card. He's trying to lay all of the blame for, for what's gone on and the, 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 the horrible situation that's emerged. He's laying all of the blame at the feet of someone else. It's their fault. They did it. He's, uh, he's showing us that thing, isn't he? Sorrow and repentance are not the same thing. Sorrow and repentance are not the same thing. Paul Tripp, um, in one of his books, uh, has this great line where he says, um, sinful people respond sinfully to being sinned against. I think if, if we could get our heads around that statement, I think that would, that would bring so much sense <laughs> to the way in which we interpret our interactions. Sinful people respond sinfully to being sinned against. That's what Esau does. And he feels sorrow. He feels regret, he feels sadness, but he doesn't repent. Feeling bad about something bad that's happened is not the same as repenting, as making right a relationship with another, but, but primarily making it right before God. It's a bit like if you got on the tube, isn't it? If you got on the tube in London and you, you accidentally turn the wrong way, you got on the tube, tube going the wrong way, sorrow is sitting there on the tube going the wrong way, so I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. I just every time I always go, you stay sat. Repentance is saying, I'm going, I need to get off. I need to turn around. I need to go on the other side. I need to go the right way. It's so easy to play the blame game. It's so easy to attribute fault somewhere else. And don't mishear me. There are situations where there are victims and abusers. But I just think in so many situations, it's way more complex than that. And we are so reluctant to own our part in it because it's humbling and it's hard. A little while ago, uh, situation in our church, I, uh, I mishandled it. And, uh, and I did some things the wrong way round. And, um, and I upset some people in the process of doing that. And I had to go and see them. And I had to do that hard and humbling thing of, of sitting down, owning what I'd done, confessing it, and saying, I, I, I need to ask you to forgive me. I need to repent to God. I need to repent to them. But it's very painful, isn't it? It's so painful. Everything within us doesn't want to do it. But sometimes we need to. If you're in one of those situations now, maybe you need to have a really honest look. You won't be wholly to blame, unlikely. But what's the part that you need to own? You need to repent to God. And you need to make that step toward another Sorrow and repentance are not the same, but repentance is necessary. Here's our final scene. Final scene is it backfires on Rebecca and Jacob too. Esau, verse 41, we read, he, he held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. I'm going to murder him. I'm going to get him when, as soon as the days for morning are done, he's a dead man. And uh, Rebecca says, she's always got a plan. She sent for her younger son and said, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. And when your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? It's going to backfire on them too. Jacob is about to go from frying pan to fire, isn't he? He's about to be sent to Laban. If he, if he thinks he's good at deceit, he is about to go and stay with Uncle Laban for 20 long years. And the cycle will work itself out all over again. 
But Rebecca too, and this, this may be for me, this is one of the saddest things in this entire narrative. Do you remember when she said, let the curse fall on me? She says here, literally in the Hebrew it reads something like, go away for a few days. I'll send you away for, for just but a few days and then, and then you can come back, my favourite, you can come back. If you read the narrative really carefully, you'll see Rebecca does not appear again. It seems entirely possible to me that she will never see Jacob again. Her favourite son, her beloved son, because of what she's done, she'll never see him again. Let the curse fall on me. And there it is. Sin has its consequences, doesn't it? Sin has consequences. Maybe you're, you're learning to live with that. Especially when relationships break down. Even in the instances where you go and make it up with somebody. And you do that work of reconciliation. How often it, the, the relationship isn't quite the same, is it? It can take a long time for real healing. For real trust to be rebuilt. Sin has its consequences. And sometimes in this life we need to learn to live in that place. How do, we, how do we apply this? Let me close by giving you three brief applications. The first application is, uh, is this, perhaps the most obvious, is that don't be like them. Like, like read it, see it, identify it, don't do it. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6, Paul says of some of the history of Israel, uh, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. The most surface level of application is to see what they did, see the havoc that is wreaked by this deception and this scheming. Take heed of it. Don't follow in their footsteps. The second thing, second way of applying this is, um, is to see in this, this description, see it not just as a portrait, but as a mirror. Because I, I don't know about you, you can, you can look at their behaviour and think, well, I don't do that, but let, let's think about what we've learned. I, I put my wants over God's words. I fear the consequences of sin more than I fear God. I play the blame game. I can live with self-pity and sorrow instead of repentance. I'm not so different, Really? Jeremiah 17 says the heart is deceitful above all things. Romans 3 tells us there is no one righteous, not even one. No one understands, no one who seeks God. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. If, if, if I'm really honest as I, as I look at this, if I'm really honest, am I ready to pick up the first stone to cast Isaac or Esau, Rebecca or Jacob. I need to see. I need to see my heart is every bit as dark as theirs. And that takes us to the third application, doesn't it? I need a saviour. What's, what's the solution out of all of this mess is you and I, we need a saviour. We need someone different. We need someone of whom it could be said there was no deceit in his mouth. No deceit in his mouth. We need someone who can, who can pray that prayer knowing full well what they meant by it. Let the curse fall on me. Jesus knew exactly what he was taking on when he, he prays that kind of prayer as he goes to the cross, as he bears the full weight, the full wrath, the just wrath of God against my sin. We need someone who can take it away. Someone who can deal with it. Someone who can bear the curse. We need someone who can bear the betrayer's kiss and give the blessing to people who really don't deserve it. We need someone who can give us new clothes. Not, not the devil's clothes, but the clothes of Christ's righteousness. We need him to clothe us. We need the Saviour, if we, can, if we can see in this passage the, the true reflection of ourselves and our hearts, we see our need for another. We see our need for the Saviour who can heal us, forgive us and restore us. 
God's relentless grace, pursuing the people in their mess. Here's one quote to finish. God's ability to clean things up is infinitely greater than our ability to mess things up. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we we look at the lives of Esau and Jacob, of Isaac and Rebecca, as we see the scheming and the deceit, if we're honest, we can see ourselves in there too. And so we want to confess our sin this morning, confess the ways in which we have held your arm's length, the ways in which we've feared others more than you, the ways in which we've uh, experienced sorrow but resisted repentance. We thank you for the Saviour. We thank you for the one who gives us new clean clothes. We thank you for the one who bore the betrayer's kiss and let the curse that should have come on us come on him. Father, would your amazing grace encourage us and equip us to walk gratefully in your ways. Amen. Amen. So we need to see our sinfulness and we need a saviour. I'm going to respond in this song, um, The Power of the Cross. And in this verse it says, I to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. That's your sin, that's my sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. Let's stand, let's respond, let's sing to our Saviour.
Do please have a seat. The Lord's been saying something particularly that you'd value the chance to pray with someone through. Our prayer team is across in the prayer area just here, my left, your right. Do come and pray with someone. They'd be delighted to pray with you. And if you're joining online, do send in a prayer request to prayer at keswickministries.org. As you head out to uh, from the tent in a moment. Do pick up a teaching and training leaflet. You can find more details about those there. And then this evening, we've got the evening celebration in here or across with Keswick Unconventional at 7.30, there's windows on the word for an arts reflection on lament and God's word. But now let's pause and let's pray together at the end of our morning. Thank you, loving Lord Jesus, that you've taken on yourself the curse, the curse of the law, the curse that rightly came to humanity for our rebellion. Thank you. Thank you for the new clothes that we have in Christ. Thank you that there is relentless grace for rat bags. Go before us into the rest of this day. Give us joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall this time. 